When you go to a train station or a tube station, you might have been told to stand behind the yellow line. You might have thought, well, why does the yellow line have to be so far from the platform edge? I can very well put another foot in front of the yellow line and still not fall down from the platform edge. Well, I'm going to show you that this is not going to be a good idea. The reason why it is not a great idea to stand too close to the platform edge has to do with the Bernoulli principle, which is a law of fluid dynamics published by Daniel Bernoulli in 1738. To be able to explain why it is dangerous to stand near a platform edge, we need to first consider a simple example and apply the Bernoulli principle to this simple example and finally go back to our example of the train platform. So let's get started. The simple example I want to consider first is when the air flows through maybe a pipe that changes width. The thin neck of this pipe is like the narrow gap formed by a person and a train on a platform edge. We are going to see exactly how it works by looking at the simple example of a pipe with a changing width. The air particles are being blown by a hairdryer to the right at a velocity v1 before they enter what is called the constriction zone, where the thickness of the pipe changes. Well, of course, air particles are not static, so they won't actually be moving in a straight line straight to the right. These air particles are actually constantly in random motion, and this random motion gives the air its temperature. But put together, the random motion will cancel out, and the hairdryer, which exerts a net force on the air particles, will cause a net action to the right. So the random motion of the air particles only contribute to the heat and temperature of the particles, but it is the net force exerted by the hairdryer that makes the whole patch of air move, causing a net motion. We will look at this one patch of air here. As this patch of air approaches the constriction zone, or the change in width of the pipe, less particles can flow through the neck at once, because there's less space. But at the back, other troops of air particles are getting close to this constriction zone too, which means that our patch of particles still has to make it through the constriction zone in the same time as the air at the back is catching up. Even though our patch of air has less space to go through, this is a bit unfair, but the only way is if our little group of air splits into more columns and the air particles pass through one by one but each sub-column has to go through that constriction zone at a higher velocity v2. Since the air at the back is basically pu pushing on our patch of air to go through quickly, so by increasing its speed, our patch of air makes it through in time. The point is, air that goes through a constriction zone has a higher velocity. What Bernoulli realised was that the changing velocities of a stream of fluids, so gas or liquid, causes a change in pressure of that gas or liquid. More specifically, at the constriction zone, the fact that our air has a higher velocity causes a lower pressure compared to the pressure in the purple box. The higher the air's velocity, the lower its pressure. And the lower its velocity, the higher its pressure. In more numerical terms, Bernoulli came up with an equation. Here it is. It's a lot of symbols, but, but please don't be scared a lot of the terms won't come into play in our simple example. Now let's first look at the equation more generally. We first notice that both sides of the equation look roughly the same. Specifically, the first term of either side, P, tells us about the pressure energy, which basically tells us how high the pressure it is. The second term tells us the kinetic energy of the fluid. In crude terms, the movement of the air causes it to have some oomph which can be described by its kinetic energy. That oomph is associated with how much mass the air has and how fast it is moving. The third term describes the potential energy that the air has due to how high it is above the ground. So my pen has more potential energy here than it has here. As we can see, the sum on the left side, the pressure energy plus the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is equal to the sum of the three energies on the right. So it looks like some kind of energy conservation law. Now we will play with the terms of the equation to see how each energy affects other ones. If we make the left-hand side stay as it is, and if we make 
the second term of the right-hand side, kinetic energy larger, and we make the third term stay put, then the first term, the pressure energy, must go down because the sum of the three terms must add to the left-hand side, which stays constant. So by just playing with the terms, we can see that for this equation, with a rise in one type of energy, there must be a decrease in another. In fact, for the same stream of air, its conditions before passing through the constriction zone can be written on the left-hand side of the equation, and its condition inside the constriction zone can be written on the right of the equation. And as the air passes from a wide pipe to a narrow pipe, the sum of the pressure energy, the kinetic energy, and the potential energy of our patch of air must be conserved through this equation. Now, let's go through the symbols in this equation. Please don't be scared of it. As you can see, a lot of the terms on the left-hand side is the same thing as the right-hand side. So the big P just tells us about the pressure. Now, this weird P here is called rho. It's the density of the liquid or gas, and in our pipe example, it is the density of the air inside the pipeline. Rho stays fixed in our example, as the density of the air does not change in this pipe. So rho stays the same for the left-hand side and the right-hand side. G, small g, is the gravitational acceleration of Earth on us, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. And g is unchanged as the air goes from the wide to the narrow pipe because we didn't change gravity. H stands for height. And in our example, there is no rise or fall in the height from the left to the right, so the height stays fixed. Well, yes, it's true that when air particles go through the constriction zone, the air particles at the top of the wide pipe must go down, and the air particles at the bottom of the wide pipe must go up. So there is a change in height. However, we take the mean average position of all air particles to be its height. So for the wider stream of air in the bottle, we take it as if it is a concentrated vector, and we do the same thing for the air at the constriction zone and we get that two streams have the same height. Let us go back to the equation. We have just explained that rho gh stays the same in the wide pipe and in the narrow pipe. So the third term, the potential energy, is conserved across both sides of the equation. The second term, the kinetic energy, the velocity v changes because the air particles have to move faster to get through a narrower tubing. A change in the velocity will in turn change the pressure. So we can simplify this equation as such, since rho gh in the bottle and rho gh at the bottleneck is the same. On the left-hand side of this equation, the velocity in the bottle is v1, which is the velocity of the air in the wider section of the pipe. And the pressure, p1, is whatever the pressure turns out to be when the air is flowing in the wider section. We know that the velocity of air as it passes through the bottleneck will increase to a higher velocity, let us call it v2. In our case, v2 is larger than v1. Now we want to see what happens to the pressure at the constriction zone. Well, for this, we need to rearrange this mass equation to make p2 the subject. So here is p2. Since v2 is larger than v1 in our case, the thing inside the bracket will always be negative. Then the whole term here is also negative. So P2 is smaller than P1 if V2 is larger than V1. In other words, for a stream of air with a constant density flowing in a tube, the faster it flows, the less the pressure there is in the tube. And this is the most important conclusion that we draw. I am going to do a demo to show that indeed an increase in velocity of a gas would decrease the gas's pressure. I hang two pieces of paper parallel to each other and blow my hairdryer in the space between the paper, not on the paper itself but in between the paper. You'll notice that the two pieces of paper would go towards each other. This is because as, as the stream of air passes through an area of constriction created by the two pieces of paper, its velocity increases and the pressure in between the paper would decrease. The pressure outside is higher than the pressure inside 
and the difference in pressure would give us a force exerted across the surface area of the paper. Since force is pressure times the area, that force is used to accelerate the paper. The key argument for the Bernoulli principle is the pressure difference. I also played around a bit and I found out something cool. When I put the hairdryer at the bottom of the two pages and I shift the hairdryer up to the top of the paper, the suction is a lot larger. However, when I start off by putting the hairdryer at the top of the paper, the suction is not so large. It is only when I move the hairdryer up and down that the suction is larger when the hairdryer is at the top. And how does that work? Please leave comments down below and tell me what you think is happening. I was pretty happy with this demo, but I had a doubt, because it could be the Magnus effect causing this to happen. Check out the link in the description for my other video explaining the Magnus effect. To prove or to disprove the Magnus effect on the two sheets of paper, I rolled the two papers into rolls, and I think this prevents the Bernoulli principle from taking serious effect, because the contact area of the paper to the fast stream of air is so small that the force exerted on a paper, which is the pressure times the contact area, is also small. So should we observe a lot of acceleration, it would not be due to the Bernoulli principle and it would be due to the Magnus effect. That is why I thought by rolling the paper, I, I could test whether the Magnus effect instead of the Bernoulli principle was in play. So I blew air in between the same two sheets of paper, just in rolls, and nothing obvious happened. I moved the rolls closer together and nothing happened until the hairdryer blew directly onto the paper, so the paper rolls started swinging like pendulums. This to me is evidence that the Magnus effect is not in play. So my conclusion is that the Magnus effect would not take place in blowing the paper, so that the Bernoulli principle is in play when I blow my hairdryer in between two flat pieces of paper. Feel free to criticise my methodology and my conclusion by leaving comments down below. I would really appreciate your opinions. What do you think? Is it the Magnus effect or the Bernoulli principle that causes the two sheets of paper to fall in? One other thing I want to point out is that the mass of the paper affects by how much the paper falls into each other. For example, if I hold one thick pile of paper and one thin sheet of paper and blow in between, the thin sheet of paper moves by a lot, but the large pile of paper barely moves. It makes sense. The force created by the pressure change in an area due to the Bernoulli principle is used to accelerate the two piles of paper. And if it's only a thin paper, then the mass is small and it will get accelerated a lot. Whereas if it's a big pile of paper, the mass is large and it will get accelerated less. This fact is going to help me explain why stepping over the yellow line is so dangerous. At the train station, a train moving at a high speed would drag a layer of air with it as it moves. If this train approaches a platform on which you are standing close to the platform edge, you are like that thin sheet of paper and that train moving at a high speed is that big pile of paper which has a lot of mass. The train will drag a layer of air with it and that layer of air will, will enter a constriction zone as it passes between you and the train. It will create an area of low pressure between you and the train and you will be accelerated inwards by a lot because you are light while the train will be accelerated by like a tiny amount because it has a lot of mass. This is why standing too close to the platform edge is dangerous, because should a high-speed train come by, you will crash into the train by the pressure. And we finally gave an answer to the question that we started with, and we've come a long way. Congratulations for following right till the end, and thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, thoughtful, or cool, Please like and subscribe and ring that bell to catch the next videos I make. I think next I'm going to make a series of videos on the topic of light, which is allowing you to see me right now. So ring that bell and catch my next video. Thank you and have a good day.